Well, essentially, unmanaged climate change would take us some time to the end, in the end of this century to concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which might take us, might mean 30, 40, 50 percent probability, to four or five degrees above the 19th century. We have not seen temperatures like that on the planet for 30 million years around. All this is roughly, but around 30 million years. We humans as Homo sapiens have been here perhaps 200,000. We've not seen anything remotely like that. When we were four or five degrees centigrade below the 19th century was the last ice age, very recently, 10, 12,000 years ago. You could not really survive at latitudes um, above those of London. That means redrawing where people can live. If you redraw where people can live, it means mass movements of population, hundreds of millions possibly in this country, possibly billions, and that would lead to conflict. Anyone who understands uh, Indian history will recognize the conflict that can come with the movements of population on scale, and we're talking about much bigger scale than we've seen at any time in human history. All these are possibilities, but they're not, po they're not with small probabilities. These are things which could really happen from unmanaged climate change. The scientists tell us that anything much above two degrees centigrade would look, uh, start to look very dangerous. Indeed, we haven't seen three degrees centigrade on this planet for around three million years. So the challenge is to try to hold temperature increases to two degrees centigrade above the 19th century or less. We can manage that, but only if we act strongly now. We're going to have to get down overall emissions in the world from around 50 billion tonnes of CO2 a year where they are now to perhaps 20, 40 years from now. We have to cut by a factor of two and a half. If the world economy grows by a factor of three, it means you have to cut emissions per unit of output by three times two and a half, seven or eight. That means essentially an energy industrial revolution, starting now, because this is a story of a build-up of stocks from the flows that we put out each year as humans, flows of emissions. So that means starting now, otherwise we're going to miss the chance of holding to two degrees centigrade. So how do we embark on this new energy industrial revolution? Well, that's the question which is posed for this year's Disha group. How can we learn from what's happening, the actions that are being taken in the UK and India, how we can accelerate this process? Because the world as a whole is going far too slowly. So the group that gets together to do this has to have broad experience across different parts of human activity and the economy and it has to have different analytical disciplines because they all come in. That's the kind of group that you need and I believe that's the kind of group that Disha can offer and will offer and has offered already in its first example. Developing countries, emerging market economies are the biggest part of the world population, perhaps now 6 billion in the 7 billion in the world. What they do over the next 30 or 40 years is actually the most important, simply by weight of numbers. On the other hand, rich countries have a great responsibility because they got rich on high carbon growth. They're responsible largely for the difficult starting point that emissions have already accumulated. They also have, at least for the moment, stronger technological backgrounds and they have greater resources, at least per capita, to um, bring to bear to deal with those problems. So you've got to have rich countries and poor countries and emerging market countries working together. How can people work together? Well, it helps a bit if you've got some common culture and common history. And the great good fortune of the UK and India is their histories are inextricably intertwined. I think on balance, not always of course, but I think on balance the benefit of both. So the UK and India are of special importance here in their ability to combine 
rich country perspectives and responsibilities and poor country perspectives together. And that is why I think Disha and the UK-India partnership has so much to contribute here. If you're asking about how you learn together, how you provide leadership together, how you get into the detail of these problems, then you're going to have to think them through very carefully. And it's enormously valuable that the Disha group is getting together and doing that as the best and the brightest of the two countries together and asking themselves how can we learn from our own experience to tackle what is one of the defining problems or challenges of the 21st century. Indeed, I would argue that the two defining challenges of the 21st century are overcoming world poverty and managing climate change. If we fail on one, we fail on the other. And the UK and Indian young people working together can do so much here. So it's enormously cheering that this thing is happen happening, and I wish you all the very best of luck.